it's not yet Friday. It's it's the middle of the week, so all is forgiven. Okay. So I click the record button. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining one of this month's virtual Q&A webinars hosted by the AVCP Community Services Division. We do have another webinar that's going to be hosted next week on Wednesday at the same time. That's more geared towards tribal administration. The registration link will be coming out on Facebook after this event, so keep an eye out for that. My name is Denise Nerby. I'm the training manager for the Community Services Division at AVCP. I was born and raised here in Bethel, and I, I apologize for not having my myself on camera. Like I said, if I have my camera going, I'm worried about glitching out, and I want to avoid that. So um, as I was saying, I was born and raised here in Bethel. My parents are Barbara and Carl Anvil Sr. Um, I'm married with three children, two boys ages 13 and 11, and my daughter is four. If you've joined any of our last three webinars, you may remember my housekeeping speech. Um, today's training is being recorded for future viewing and will be available on the AVCP YouTube channel. To start off in the virtual environment, everyone is muted. So if you're joining over the phone to unmute yourself, you'll press star six and that will also remute you if you need to be. If you need to be. Um, remuted. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there is a little microphone button at the top right hand side of your screen that will also do the same function if you're joining online. Um, and also, if you're joining online, there is an available chat feature that you could use to ask questions during the event. If you're not comfortable unmuting to speak up, we have staff that will pay attention to the chat to make sure that your questions are asked and hopefully answered. <laughs> um, also, if you're not comfortable having anything asked online, we do have um, AVCP staff that you could reach out to by phone at 907-543-8550, which is the Tribal Justice Department. Their email address is tribal-justice at avcp.org. So I feel like that was a lot of talking, <laughs> but in today's session, we're going to learn about codes and ordinances from our presenter, Deborah O'Gara, who is an assistant professor with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you and mute myself, Deborah, while I get your, your presentation on, on the screen. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. And if I'm seeing everybody's names on here, okay. Um, I know a number of you, so it's really good to see you, you all. Um, I have just in, in ways of introduction, I want to let folks know that, as Denise said, my name is Deborah O'Gara. My Clinket name is Dejuk Suk. I am a Tiatan Raven Frog. My ancestors are originally from Wrangell, and I'm calling in from Sikakwan, which is otherwise known as Petersburg, down in southeast Alaska. And um, I'm going to be talking for probably only about 30, maybe 40 minutes at the very most. And then I'm going to hopefully, um, hopefully you all will be taking notes and coming up with some questions afterwards about some of this topic. And I do apologize. I was trying to figure out how to edit this cover page for the PowerPoint. This is actually a PowerPoint that Rick Garcia and I did um, last year, or la yeah, last year, um, at uh, when we were in Bethel, and so um, I made I've made a few changes, but essentially it's the same uh, presentation. So, without any further delay, we will get started. I see there's still a few people coming on, so that's great. So good. Um, as Denise said, I've been asked to give a presentation about um, codes and, and ordinances and primarily written codes, but I can't talk about laws, tribal laws, without also talking about some of our unwritten um, laws. So I'm going to be saying next 
Um, next slide. Whenever, because I think Denise has control over me here. Very good. Denise, you get an A for the day. <laughs> All right, um, this sometimes will be a little bit, um, if for anybody who has been through some of the other um, presentations I have um, made, you'll know that I usually um, start off with where do our tribes and tribal governments get their authority or their sovereign powers to enact laws or pass laws. And really it comes from the members or citizens of the tribe. Uh, the citizens, we as citizens of our tribes, are the um, are the really do have the power. And as citizens of a tribe or a country or a city or of a state, we delegate that um, authority to our governments. And in this case, we're talking about our tribal governments. <clears throat> and so the sovereign powers. Um, that our tribal governments have come directly from um, us as members of that tribe. And we do that because we want our, um, we have empowered our governments to help provide um, primarily public safety and um, protection from, um, from bad things happening, from the environment, um, land management, um, natural resource management, et cetera, um, which um, are all things that we want our government to do on our behalf. And so it's, in this case, it's our tribal councils, whether they're appointed or elected, who make the laws and also pass ordinances. You'll also hear me talk about statutes, codes, laws, ordinances. They all mean the same thing. They are the laws, written, primarily written laws. I know some tribes in Alaska use the term statutes, and um, I, I know my tribe, Clinkett and Haida, um, down here in Southeast, um, will often refer to laws as statutes, primarily because it um, puts the tribe on par with the state of Alaska, which refers to their laws as statutes. But um, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever each tribe wants to call their laws, either law, written laws, statutes, codes, um, or ordinances. They all mean the same thing. And then it is our, once laws have been passed or enacted and um, whether they're written down or um, unwritten, then it's up to a tribal court or justice system to actually um, work to enforce those laws. And again, there's a whole nother presentation or class or training on, on tribal court um, slash justice system and how those, how the laws get enacted. So we'll save that for another one. Next slide, please. So our written laws um, are have a variety of there's a variety of types of of written laws. Um, the primary one is our tribal constitutions. And back in the 30s, 30s and 40s, the BIA helped to um, um, Rec or started recognizing tribal governments and because constitutions were important and that's where it spells out exactly what the tribal government is actually going to be doing then um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs came through with some templates or model constitutions so um, throughout Alaska many not all but many of the tribes um, reviewed and enacted and, and um, put into effect um, constitutions, and many of them look fairly um, similar to one another, though I have noticed um, that maybe a good, a good portion of the tribes in Alaska have since the um, 30s and the 40s have, have gone in and made amendments to those constitutions. But why are the constitutions so important? 
primarily it lays out what what um, authority, what inherent authority has been given to the tribal government, and um, and um, the constitution, unlike written laws or um, statutes can't be changed by the tribal government without the approval of the tribal citizens. So again, we always go back to um, the highest power in a tribe is its citizens. And then the ordinances um, are actually enacted or voted on, approved by the tribal council or tribal government, whatever form of government your tribe has. That's who's um, empowered to actually make the laws. Now, it's always a good idea to write the laws down, though it's not required. It's also a really good idea, which we're gonna talk about here next, um, for the tribal council or government to actually consult with and um, ask for input from the citizens, from the tribes, from the membership. And sometimes, and I have seen also um, some tribes go as far as not just from members, but from the entire community. Um, some of our communities are have non-tribal members who are residing and work and raising families in our tribal communities. And a tribal government um, certainly is um, able to, and I've seen um, some go out of their way to make sure that um, everybody in the community has is has got an opportunity to be a part of the lawmaking process. Uh, next slide. So just in summary, tribal members vote and um, enact the constitutions, tribal councils, vote and pass any ordinances or laws or statutes and the authority of the tribal council or tribal government whatever form the tribal government takes is um, um comes from the membership uh, from its citizens next slide so i've mentioned a couple times already that um, tribes all have traditional or unwritten laws. And um, there are still some tribes that have not written down those unwritten laws, though there's um, some who have. And, um, and it really is up to each tribe. There's no um, higher authority, uh, state or federal, that's gonna come in and tell a tribe that it has to put its laws into writing. Um, and some of the um, tribes, not just in Alaska, but also um, down south tribes, sometimes will put in um, to their constitution or into their written laws a clause or a, uh, a, 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 a section that recognizes the existence of traditional unwritten laws and that they not only exist, but they are the highest um, form of tribal law and should be um, looked at um, when looking at written laws. And actually some go as far as saying that the unwritten laws have a um, higher authority than anything written. So, um, and I think this recognition of traditional and or oral um, laws and traditions is really important to remember, especially for tribes that are either um, just beginning to form their justice system or are um, expanding their justice system to really look at what are the unwritten laws for your community and your tribe, and do you, um, do you the tribe, um, collectively want um, recognition of those unwritten traditional laws. And if you do, then this, and this is just um, some language that we've seen in, in the um, statutes, sometimes in the constitution, sometimes in the um, laws. Okay, next slide. So again, this presentation is about our, about tribal um, statutes and written laws. So 
if we have oral laws and uh, written statutes, I mean, oral and traditional laws, why do we need to write down our laws? So there's a couple of good, good best practices and um, good good things to do. We live in a in a time now where we have a lot of interaction with um, folks from outside our communities. Some of our communities even are um, blended and have a mixture of native and non-native. We have some economic development as well as education um, going on. We also have some communities where there is a city or town government, elected government, who does have written laws and that, that functions alongside the tribal government um, who may or may not have written laws. So it's um, always a good idea, again, not required, but a good idea to um, put your law, your tribal laws into writing for a number of different reasons. These, the three that are on this slide are just three, I think, of the most important ones. It helps to avoid any conflict, and it helps to make sure that everybody in the community who is going to be governed by these laws actually know what the rules are, what's legal, illegal, what, um, you know, if, if for instance, there's a, if the, for instance, is a um, leash law for dogs, to be tied up at all times or under the voice control of, of their owners. And um, you want to make sure that everybody knows what that is so that they have an opportunity to then abide by those laws or rules. You also want to um, write down the laws. And this is going to be, I think, probably the main portion of my uh, presentation today. You want people, <clears throat> you want the community to um, take part in um, in the lawmaking process in actually helping to decide what laws should be enacted. Oh, I see a typo. So people can, not con, um, be a part of the process and um, a because you want the laws to actually reflect the priorities and the Whole, the whole sense of, uh, of priorities that the community as a whole um, believes in. And then um, I think the last thing that actually happens when you involve people in the lawmaking process is they have much more trust and respect for the justice system that's gonna, net, that's gonna then um, in, um, enforce those laws. Now that doesn't become automatic. It's just one part of building the trust in your justice system. Next slide. Okay, tribal court development, a code development. Um, because the um, authority to make and enforce tribal laws comes from its members, it is absolutely, and I've underlined this, um, um, word, it's absolutely essential for the tribal government or council to involve, look for ways to, and it be, could be multiple ways, to include and involve the community and its tribal members in the process of making those laws. And that can be done in a number of different ways. It can be done by having open council meetings where, you know, flyers get posted up or uh, radio announcements inviting everybody to come to the council meetings because new, a new ordinance or a new law is going to be discussed and, and making sure that the meetings are not only open and, and widely advertised so that folks know that, that that's going on, but then structuring, structuring the meetings so that there's actual opportunity for tribal members to um, get up and ask questions, to make recommendations, to offer suggestions, and in some in, in some cases actually um, provide members with the opportunity to make edits to any written drafts that have um, been that are have been or are being circulated. 
And again, this helps to not only um, uh, inform everybody of what the law, um, once it is passed, what um, its purpose is, and again, helps to instill a sense of, of ownership or, or trust and legitimacy to the whole lawmaking process. It also, and I'm not sure if um, I really have put this into writing, but it also helps give the tribal government slash council an opportunity to hear from its members, what are the priorities in the community? You know, the council, it, you know, especially in our small communities, the council themselves are members of the community, but sometimes um, they're not, um, they, they're, they're only exposed to maybe only a small number of people and um, maybe in their, if they're fishermen, then, the, then one of their priorities is going to be fishing, whereas um, there might be other priorities that are um, just as important that need to be considered. So you want to have those open meetings so that your um, your tribal council um, slash governments can um, hear uh, opinions from uh, as wide a variety of um, community members as possible, tribal members as possible. It also helps to have um, not just one gathering or one open meeting, but a series of them. And sometimes, especially with a long, a long, um, complicated or complex um, code or statute, it might be um, better to um, maybe have a series of open meetings that has a presentation. This is what the law would do. This is why this is the purpose of the law. And then having some discussion um, and questions about um, what would happen if, if this draft got enacted as a law and give folks an opportunity to ask questions, look at some of the pluses and minuses of the of the um, law, and some of the consequences. Some what would happen if somebody violated um, this law as it's being present as it's being drafted. So you want to have as thorough discussion as possible um, with that. And the best way to do that is um, in not just a one hour um, community meeting, but maybe a series of them or a day-long retreat, or whatever is going to work. Next slide. So you want to also be able to look at or ha not have both the government, tribal government, and the um, citizens um, know what the uh, effect of any law is going to actually be. And for instance, if it's a uh, juvenile justice type um, law, what are going to be some of the um, consequences or accountability um, um, that's going to be imposed on, on youth who violate um, any of the provisions or offenses as they're outlined? And are the offenses in the, for instance, the youth code actually getting to the um, main priorities and safety concerns in the community? Um, for instance, if, if um, a code is being proposed um, concerning um, um, I don't know uh, driving while under the influence, but you live in a village that only has three cars and driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs is not really an issue. What really is the issue is you've got a dry community and you've got folks um, bringing in alcohol and or drugs in a way that's becoming unsafe for the community. So you're the the so if you have open meetings, you might be able to get to the to the this isn't really this proposed law isn't really getting to the to the main issue that's of concern to the community members. And so you want to have um, all of this. And you know, I'm outlining some of these, and I think this um, the the sentence here under that first bullet point that um, this is true for all justice systems. This, this, all of these suggestions that I'm making that are, I think, good practices for any government and any citizenry, whether it's um, tribal, state, 
uh, municipality or even federal um, to follow, I, I argue that or believe that um, this same process should be followed um, anytime that laws are being looked at and added or amended in some way. Um, then the last thing is once the law has been uh, fully discussed and the lawmakers, which is your tribal government, your tribal council, has um, made, has um, uh, come up with a final draft, it's really important to then have somebody look at it to make sure. And here I would argue that doesn't always necessarily mean a lawyer. And I'm saying that as a lawyer, but sometimes you be, sometimes you want somebody that's not a lawyer or is not even um, got, you know, a, a lot of education um, because you want your laws to be easily read and understood and very clear. So you want to make sure that the words all are all not just spelled correctly and the punctuation is correct, but you also want to make sure that the language that's being used in the law is clear and concise and easily understood by all members of the community. And, and I, and I'll, I should add this to this slide. That means also that if you have 80% of your community um, has English as a second language, then perhaps your laws should also be written in the language that is predominant in your community. And look at that. Uh, next slide. Okay, a little bit of a uh, refresher or and some new things. So when you're looking at developing laws, you want to um, encourage folks to come to the meetings. And that really means um, setting up the meetings on days and times when people can actually go and and actually make it to the meetings. So you if you've got um, most folks working, and not being able to um, get off work then um, during the day, then you want to try to have either week a week um, um, evenings or um, weekends. You may also want to have special membership meeting um, and um, and do dinners or door prizes to get people to actually come. Um, this is a one of my favorite suggestions is um, if you have a high school um, in your village to hold the meetings at the high school and encourage the youth to come. And I say this not just when you're dealing with or looking at um, putting together and drafting a youth code or a juvenile justice code, but your youth in your community, if you involve them in the lawmaking process um, from that when they're still young, they are more likely to um, both understand and be be um, really motivated to participate um, as they get older as well. You can also do uh, written or oral surveys, door to door surveys, just again to do one on one um, feedback. Some people are not comfortable talking up in large uh, groups. And then um, you also want to look at maybe posting the draft of any written law in public areas, whether that be the post office or the general store, um, and have copies available so that folks can read them um, at their leisure and give time to, for that to happen. Next slide. Other ideas is to, um, um, to solicit um, tribal member input um, <clears throat> is you can do it, you can find a number of ways. You can, um, you know, have, I don't know, um, have small groups formed where they're reading um, a new law together, uh, maybe involve the school and get, um, make it part of a curriculum for a, um, a civil um, or social studies class or something like that so that, um, and then one of the assignments could be the, the students go home and talk to their parents about what this new law is. 
And there's a no, number of other, other types of resources that are available. Now, this might be a controversial statement, but I, I will never tell a tribe not to use outside consultants because I think we, I think there's a number of out of when I say outside, I mean um, outside of Alaska consultants that are coming in and providing some really good, valuable information that we that all of our tribes can benefit from. But I want to caution tribes from relying solely on outside con consultants um, who may not have a lot of experience or knowledge about Alaska tribes or specifically about your region. And um, so do take that into um, account and look for ways once the consultant, if that's the route that you're going to do, has come in and given their advice, then then find ways like I've just one of one or all of the ways that I've just mentioned about how to involve your um, own community members to um, thoroughly uh, review and be able to comment on the um, the laws that you're um, drafting and hoping to enact. Next slide. Okay, other resources. You can go to, and we have 229 tribes in this state, and some of the, and we're all at different levels. All of our tribes are from no code, no codes and laws at all, to um, lots of codes on almost every subject and everything in between. So we have a lot of resources right here in this state, just looking at other tribes throughout the state, and. I would encourage you to sometimes even go outside of your region if, if you are not finding any um, resources um, to use. And um, so most tribes will be very open or have already put their codes on their website. And you can um, go to their website or just call their their court system or their um, tribal council and see if they can just send you copies of their statutes and laws. And um, they'll, they're, most are happy to do that. These templates or examples from other tribes or even other tribes, whether they be from Alaska or from um, the lower 48, are all very useful. But again, make sure that you don't just copy and paste um, somebody else's laws and make it your own without, again, a thorough review and discussion in your community. Involve the youth, and I say that not just for youth uh, issues that affect youth, but all of them. TCC also has a number of, of, of um, laws and statutes that they have um, drafted for their, um, their member tribes, as has um, ABCP. So, the um, um, justice, uh, travel justice um, department at ABCP has a lot as well. Um, you can also go to um, Alaska Legal Services and or NARF, uh, Native American Rights Foundation, um, and other national organizations. Um, and I'll just say one thing that's not on this list is um, travel law and Policy Institute, TLPI, and they have an excellent website. Um, if you just go to TLPI, and I'll edit this, this slide to include them next time I give this talk. Next slide, please. Now, let's see, Denise, do you got next slide? Did it not change? Are we on why are tribes wanting to hear cases? We are, but not on the screen yet. Ew, there is a little bit of a lag, I think. Yeah, that's OK. I'll just keep talking. So now let's say that you have, um, and it still hasn't changed. So um, let's say that you have, your tribe has passed a law. Oops, <laughs> now the slides are gone. So I, I stopped sharing quickly to try to reshare. Oh. Okay. Let, let me know That'll if you work. could see that. There it is. Good job. Good problem solving there, Denise. Okay, now that you have um, um, 
enacted laws, you, you want to, and actually I would say even before you do a final enactment, even before you have the tribal council actually pass the laws, you want to look at your the purpose for laws and what it is that you want to accomplish on there. And that also helps you set priorities. And you also want to look at your justice system or your co tribal court system and make sure that your court is set up to actually enforce or in, enact the um, implement the laws that you're getting ready to pass. If it hasn't, because the laws that you pass as a tribe and your court system um, need to be able to work hand in hand. And so, for instance, you don't want to pass a law, and I'll just off the top of my head, you don't want to pass a law that, um, say, a domestic violence um a domestic violence um, statute for that's going to um, um, help with with um, issuing protection orders and or holding um, um, perpetrators accountable for domestic violence offenses. You don't want to, for instance, have a law that says um, that mirrors, say, the state of Alaska of doing a mandatory arrest anytime somebody is stopped um, or there's an allegation of domestic violence. Unless you already have a some kind of jail facility and or a court that can respond um, almost immediately. So, and again, that's just an example. I'm not trying to discourage tribes from doing that. I'm just saying, that you want to make sure that whatever you are writing into your laws, you have the capacity to do it, or you have the capacity to contract with either a neighboring tribe or one of your tribal organizations like ABCP or TCC or some other um, tribal organization or the state of Alaska. So you do want to be sure to do that. One thing that we have the cap capability of doing is to really look at what it is that we want our laws to do. And this is almost universal. And again, I'm not telling tribes what to do or what you what your laws should do, but almost universally, our tribal laws are are looking more towards repairing harm that has been done in the community to individual victims and or their families um, folk, and folk, folks who have witnessed whatever has happened. And they're repairing harm to um, victims or repairing property damage, if that's um, the case. And when we're dealing with um, child abuse or neglect, we also want to look at, at um, how can we not just take, not just simply take children away, who are being abused and neglected by their parents, but how can our system and our laws help to um, um, set up services so that parents can learn to be better parents and not uh, resort to um, um, behavior that is gonna be harmful to their children. And so um, there's always a, um, a, less, a, a less punitive, um, reaction to many of our tribal laws and more of restore um, balance, um, 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 repair harm, create safety for children and victims, etc. So you want, if that's one of the um, values that you have in your community, then you definitely want to make sure that you read your final draft laws to make sure that the values that you want to want everybody to understand and follow are also reflected in your laws. Okay, next slide. Now I've also added this um, this section because sometimes our justice systems or our tribal courts can really can really be not the first step when somebody has um, started misbehaving, but 
can be almost the final step or a step that's taken after some instances. And again, I'll, I'll use, for instance, um, uh, juvenile justice, where um, you've got some offenses that are offenses only by virtue of the fact that they're being committed by somebody who is 18, uh, under 18. Those are um, drinking alcohol, um, sometimes uh, marijuana, skipping school, being out after curfew, driving without a license. Some of those things are all incidences that if they're done by an adult over 18, it's not an offense. But if they're done by a youth under 18, they are an offense. So these juvenile offenses, um, usually there is indicators or behaviors that occur prior to the youth actually committing an offense or doing something illegal that's um, in violation of a law. So having the tribe look to, to having services and or programs developed in the community that helps to um, catch some of these missteps or mistakes um, for a youth um, uh, prior to actually having to resort to taking them to court and looking at even stronger sanctions or, or methods of accountability or consequences. And I, you'll notice I'm um, purposefully avoiding the word um, uh, punishment or, or sentencing or jail. So, um, so the prevention is really more what some of our grant funders call social service programs. They can also be um, cultural programs. Um, even even one one tribe that I was um, doing a training for a few weeks ago, we were talking about how to uh, about um, the summer fish camps that are popping up all over the place over the last 20, 25 years and looking at ways of maybe replicating the idea of fish camp um, throughout the year, not just in the summer and not just for one or two weeks, but um, you know, having activities that can help um, um, teach children at youth um, uh, different um, expectations in the community and ways of behaving. So I think um, working Again, working hand in hand between the tribal council who's passing the laws and tribal courts who are enforcing the laws and the social services who can develop programs that can um, start teaching um, more acceptable and expected behavior, especially in our children and youth um, throughout and working hand in hand so that um, Eventually, my, my vision of the world is eventually then not having um, to take our youth to court in the first place, and then they don't grow up to resort to violence or other things that um, our children and our young people are learning how to do um, in the Western world that we live in. Next slide. Okay, I'm um, getting ready to, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of uh, <laughs> um, fixated on involving the youth. And I think um, it's not because I don't think we should spend any time with um, adults or even our elders, because I think um, we do. Um, I also do believe that um, we start teaching um, our youth and, uh, you know, our youth really sh helps to um, show the way, and they are our future leaders, and um, and can um, bring these ideas home as well. So, as you're getting ready to really look at um, not just building your court system or expanding it, um, if you already have one, um, but involve the youth, give them um, um, give them an opportunity to review and understand what some of the laws are, and then listen to their suggestions. And I think um, inviting elders as well to come in and look at what you're doing and listen to their suggestions. Make make a point of of allowing for feedback and or and or um, um, comments and be 
have, <clears throat> having a system, both court and travel council, having a system so that um, there's a um, ongoing evaluation and feedback and back and forth that's allowed. Not that I'm advocating for laws to to be constantly changing because I think um, villages and our communities need to have some continuity and stability in laws and in the courts. But um, if you do that from the from, at, from the very beginning as you're developing your laws, you'll have the best product that your entire community comes up with. Next slide. And then this last slide really is um, a, a repeat of what I've already said. So last slide. And it looks like I did talk for a little over, um, but I want to open it up for the uh, for any questions, comments, or um, um, discussion. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. I hear, I hear Daisy May. You could go ahead, Daisy May. Thank you. Thank you very much for that awesome presentation. Simple, clear to the point, where it's also an area identifying even within our own tribal courts, the ability of reassessing our own tribal court within our own set of eyes and lens to really evaluate and enhance our own tribal court. You had mentioned uh, something in regards to the Constitution with with the constitution is it of your message stating our constitution is the final law within a government within our own tribal government so thanks daisy may and it's nice to hear from you um the constitution actually is the um document that um, I mean, it does a, a number of things, but essentially it is the document that is um, voted on and passed by the tribe's citizens that then delegates the authority of lawmaking to the tribal government, to the council. So it also sets out and, you know, we could we could do a whole nother um, hour-long training on just the constitutions and what its purpose is, but it also lays out the whole question of jurisdiction and um, who who is going to be governed and fall under the laws that are passed by the tribal government. So it's not, so if you don't have a constitution, then which is not the case for any of our tribes in Alaska. They all, all of our tribes in Alaska have constitutions. So this is really a, a um, it could be confused because we all have one, we all have a constitution. But if for instance, you don't have a constitution, then your tribal government or your council doesn't have the authority to make laws for its citizens. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I clearly understand that, and I appreciate you uh, reaffirming that. So, mm -hmm. in closing, it also specifies following the trend of the movement of our villages, we have encountered such issues as within a conflict between state of Alaska laws versus the tribal court laws pertaining to abandonment, abandonment of an individual that is not a tribal member that is sitting or living in a community that is contributing to some substance or other issues within the community. 
So what I'm hearing you state is the word, it, has there been an abandonment code developed? And if so, I would like to see that document. That is an, another excellent question. So let me just back up a little bit. The state of Alaska actually does not have any authority to tell a tribe that it cannot ban somebody from the community. But what you run into is that tribes need to, don't have sufficient law enforcement to enforce that order. And so is needs to have some state law enforcement to help implement it. And the state has made the decision to not put, not allow its law enforcement to do that. So again, that's just a little bit of a, it may sound like the state is telling the tribes you can't do this, but they're just saying, if you do this, we're not going to help you, tribe. The state is saying that. So I hope that didn't confuse things more. And then as far as the, there being a banishment statute, I do think that there are some tribes who have enacted banishment statutes, but for the for the life of me, I can't, I can't um, think of one that I can tell you to contact. Um, but I can, um, I can contact, um, um, and you, I know you all know Rick Garcia, and he may be able to put his finger on, on uh, a tribe that's already that already has a statute, or the Alaska Native Justice Center might um, be a, another good resource. So. Um, I would contact one or both of them for some examples of a banishment statute. <clears throat> Are there any other questions for Deborah? Um, I do want to remind everybody that if you are on the phone and you need to unmute, you could do so by pressing star six. Or if you're on the online um, app, you could press the microphone button at the top right hand area of your screen. Or you could drop the question in the chat and I could ask it for you. Ubai in the chat did say that she thinks it's Kong that has a banishment statute. And I know Darlene Daniel is in the in the um, group. And if she wants to speak up, she can. <laughs> I think Kong does have one. Darlene, is that correct? Yeah, I think we have one. In one of our tribal court constitutions, mm -hmm. our code. I don't have my um code open right now, but I know we have one somewhere. In the cold. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Okay. Now, just on the banishment whole banishment issue, sometimes banishment is for a is for all time, and sometimes it's just for a period of time. And I and I have heard, and I know A and J C will do some uh, uh, some trainings, and they'll talk about this. I also know um, Kel Kevin Ellingsworth has done this as well in some of his presentations, and he'll really advise. Um, it, it, it's I've heard it be um, stated in a, in a word of advisement to tribes to use the term exclusion, and that it be that the exclusionary order be um, temporary. For instance, if there's a a domestic violence, somebody who is com um, continuing to commit domestic violence in a village um, and um, there's a protection order issued, 
excluding them from the um, from the commun from the village that the in that context then the because it's there's a federal law um, protecting um, better not speak for 60 seconds If there's a, a protection order excluding somebody who has been committing domestic violence, there's a federal law that requires the state to help the tribes to enforce that. So um, in that way, and, and sometimes that's gotten um, many of our communities a little bit confused. They'll do it, the state will come in and help with an exclusion for domestic violence, but for instance, not a banishment for bringing in drugs or alcohol. So um the and i'll just underscore the tribes can enact banishment laws but then it goes back to if you have a law you want to before you enact it you want to figure out how you're going to enforce it either you're going to have to rely on the state or the federal law enforcement or you're going to have to come up with some kind of enforcement mechanism yourself Any other questions? I had a question. This is Wayne Phillip. I work for the Gungho Tribal Court. And recently we had a series of harassment, but I realized we didn't have a harassment, like in general public harassment code. But I noticed we had general um jurisdiction to handle disputes among tribal members so in that sense we do have the ability to receive the complaint and have the judges handle it even though we don't have a specific code uh, addressing harassment Yeah, that's a good question. So your question, it sounds like your question is, is it okay if you don't have a specific written code about harassment? Are you able to do, um, are you able to present some kind of harassment violation in inside your court anyway? And sometimes you do, if you have some knowledge and or experience with your unwritten laws. And this is a perfect example of where your unwritten, your tribe's unwritten and traditional laws can really come in handy. And I'll just use an example of, um, uh, of something that I did when I was the judge down at Clinkett and Haida. There was not a guardianship for um, statute or law for a long time in the Clinkett and Haida written laws but I, um, I did know and acted on the fact that um, having relatives, especially aunties, uncles, grandparents, um, or close um, clan relatives step up to take care of children and or other vulnerable adults um, when, um, when it was needed. And based on that oral tradition or that customary uh, cultural tradition, I was able to um, issue orders of guardianship for vulnerable adults as well as elders, even though we didn't have a guardianship. And actually, I don't think we, I don't think Clinkett and Haida still doesn't have a guardianship stat, a written law for. Um, uh, vulnerable adults or elders, um, but at least when I was sitting on the bench, I issued those um, fairly routinely. I think that addressed um, the issue we were having because any tribal member can come in and state the facts um, let's say they were harassed at this location on this date at time over this reason, and then 
based on their complaint, we can go ahead and uh, address the two parties involved and try to get to the bottom of it. Right. Right, exactly. And I'll just I'll just remind folks though, I also believe even with even when you have the ability to do that, at the at the next time that your government convenes or you are looking at expanding your written laws, it's something to bring up to bring up at a community meeting or to your travel council that it might be good practice to put, you know, this issue has been coming up. It hasn't, this is how we've dealt with it. It'd be much better if we had a written law about it. And then it's up to the tribal government whether they're gonna do that or not. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, here in the uh, village of Marshall, there was um, a law to legalize alcohol and a lot of people have been complaining. And I was wondering if the tribal court can go up against like another entity within my um, community to like start a petition and then ban or reverse the legalization of a damp status like within a community. Like does the um, tribal court have authority over everyone and if it does can the tribal court issue a case or a trial against another um, entity within the community so normally the answer is no that um, there is um, court rules that are set out and there's also um, there's also just the common practice that courts, whether they're tribal or, or state or city courts, can only deal with issues that are brought to them by certain people. And often the constitution and or the court rules that is a separate code outlines who those folks are that can bring things to the court at who can bring disputes to the court. So the court on its own can't do that. But if you have a tribal member come in and challenge a tribal ordinance or statute and say this is unconstitutional or this um, is not written clearly or is too vague, then that is allowed. But if it's a city, law that you are um are that you're having issues with then the tribal court's not going to necessarily have any um authority to rule on the viability of a city rule or law and without knowing all of the details about it that's probably the best i could do hello Okay. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Angela. Under the um, tribal court, the law, and you, um, you, un, you're an unconstitutional from the law of a constitutional law, and if you get um you, you know a tribal law court order in order from what was happening in from all you know the time that they were being together or for some time um firm do you is it voted or is it firmly voted from our community, or is it firmly voted from the council? So the constitutions, when they get enacted or put into place, approved, 
is a vote of the people, of the citizens. Laws are voted on and approved by the tribal government. Does that answer your question? No, but the other answer is, I mean, the other, can you hear me? Yes. The other question is, um, firmly held, are the tribal, the tribal governing to hold? We as a tribe, as a tribe, as our um, familiar tribe member and our tribe members, if if there's a affirmative something that goes on with our family, can we can we step in for another family? Because you know it's a really small, small, small village, and we have to put in somebody else you know there's this family and this family in a tribal court are we able to um let them testify and let us do their jurisdiction or, or let us do our just jurisdiction so are you asking if there's a if there's a, a family that's wanting to resolve an issue in court and the court is staffed by members of that same family, is can somebody else come in and hear that case? Is yes. that what you're asking? Okay. Yes. So again, you'll want to, if that's if that's one of your concerns about making sure that your court can hear disputes involving anybody who's going to come in, then you'll want to have some kind of a conflict of interest policy. And you can write that into your um, into the statute that governs how the court is going to operate. And then you just have to have some um, abilities to call in, for instance, the judges or court clerk from a neighboring tribe that may not be related to come in and handle that case but so the answer to your question is yes but you'll want to you'll want to have some clear rules about in writing about how that's going to happen and can it come from the president and the vice even if it's from a family member oh you mean if the Family members are yeah. Members. The so, family uh, is a vice, and the family member is a president. Yeah. Well, again, you'll want to follow whatever conflict of interest rules you have in your government, and um, if you don't have any, you might want to look at whether you should or not. And um, yeah. So it is possible. Sometimes some people will argue that it's it's good practice to do that, but ultimately it's up to the government to do that. The government, it's the tribal council that enacts laws, including the laws that govern how the court works. The reason why I ask is, is because do we come in to a cross point. You know, everybody is in in something or they're um in they're related in some way or something. And it cross points to there. And that's a really hard decision that we have to make. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, the villages are really small. And right. there's a lot of people that the kids they don't they don't learn from their families because you know I'm gonna tell my point. 
my point is, um, do not let your family be related to your families from here or mm. over there because we're related somehow. Right. And, you know, it comes to a conclusion to where everything gets messed up. And I don't, we don't want that. Right. And yes. I just want everybody to understand that. Just talk to your kids. <laughs> That's always good, good advice. Good, good point. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Are there any more questions for Deborah out there? Hello. Um, I have an elder council here that wants to ask a question. Uh, it's coming from two o'clock again. Okay. Uh, Andrew Tulksack, our constitution was written and approved by Department of Interior in, in uh, late or early 1940s, and our traditional councils at that time, they have unwritten, written ordinance and unwritten mm -hmm. and uh, we have on, on file that we have tribal uh, ordinance that are under CFR and uh, within the state statutes mm -hmm. uh, there uh, being uh, uh, I forgot what they're being renewed now, but the, but those uh, ordinances are already approved by the community members and within the CFR uh, federal regulations. Yeah, we have those, and also in our history of Tulsac, our elders, our past elders, had a tribal uh, court, and they had a tribal hearing. I guess by walking up to Fairbanks and. Uh, deal with that person. We have those histories. Uh, the only question I have is uh, if there are uh, uh, within not, not including a conflict of interest between the community members. When we deal with the community members within our tribe, if that person is a relative of uh, the council member, we put a waiver on that person and deal with that person pers uh, personally and let that tribal council member be neutral till we decide. Those are my questions. So are you asking if um, if, it's, if it should be allowed to have waivers of the conflict of interest? Is that your question? No, uh, we use that conflict of interest when, when we really need to have have to do it mm -hmm. and they respect that. My only question to you was uh, we have written and unwritten laws from our elders that 
uh, formed the first uh, constitution, and it's approved by the Department of Interior at that time mm -hmm. in D.C., Washington, D.C. Right. That's all I'm asking. So if I if I'm understanding your question correctly, your unwritten laws that um, even even if they weren't recognized in your constitution would still be a higher authority than your written laws. Um, they came first. Your oral unwritten laws are based on your tribe's traditional knowledge and practices. And they came before the BIA and Interior Department and DC and all of that, and 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 came before your written constitution that was, you know, was um, um, given to you in a template form, and your council looked at it and reviewed it and passed it. But your traditional laws came first, and unless your constitution which I've never seen it, I've never seen, it's not unheard of, but I've not seen this happen. But unless your constitution says written laws are no more, no longer valid, which again, I've not ever seen that, that happen, then your unwritten laws are still valid. Does that answer your question? We go by the this is Angela again. So by the bylaws and the ordinances, can we go by the written bylaws and constitution from our past? Yes. So a short answer to that question, Angela, is yes. But um, Angela, can I just go back to the elder from um, who just spoke and, and make sure that I've answered his question? Yes. And... The elder that is speaking is my dad. Okay. So I'm just checking with him to make sure that I've answered his question. Uh, Andrew again. Uh, uh -huh. You answered my question. Uh, the only question I had was... Uh, uh, the, our... Uh, Tribal government never waived those ordinances. Good. And currently, right now, EVCP is uh, updating our ordinance that were passed, and we have to talk to the community members or uh, mail them out to each household for the record. Okay. Right. Good. And okay. Angela, did I? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm done. Okay, thanks. And Angela, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Sure. You you answered my question. Very good. So with all of this, I'll just add that when you're putting together and or staffing your tribal court, you'll want if if you've got if your tribe has unwritten laws that you want to make sure your tribal court or your justice system is able to enforce those unwritten laws, you'll want to make sure that you have judges that um, either know what those unwritten and understand those unwritten laws are or are willing to bring in elders and other um, cultural experts to provide information about the unwritten laws. Okay. Can that be can that be by the tribal council because we don't have nobody stepping in it can be
your travel so your travel council can step in and be the travel court judges if that's what um, you're asking. Yeah, that's what I'm asking because, you know, we've been trying to get people to come in for a tribal court and nobody's stepping in. And then AVCP says that the former governed body can be a tribal court. Is they are, that right? That is correct. Your tribal government can sit as the as the judges, either the full council or the council can designate one or two or three council members to act as the judges for the court. That is correct. We've been doing that. We've been doing that for numerous years right now. And how can we do something if, what can we do if something continuously happen, you know, to one individual and we're trying really hard to get that member that is not a membership out of our tribe. Mm -hmm. Boy, I don't, you know, I, it's hard to give any opinion without knowing all the particulars. And I don't think we have enough time to do that. But um, as part of this presentation no, today. No, that's just my question. And you could call me at any date <laughs> okay. to let me know. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, it's um, really setting down and, and, and looking at all the different resources that you have and. You've got, um, and there's a lot of a lot of resources around that I think can maybe help you. And I would start with ABCP because you're already a part of that. Oh yes, and um, there's a lot of questions because you know ABCP is not really helpful. We're okay. we're compacted with them, and then over the years. We got all these funding that comes to talk that that never helps our community. Okay, well, that's where I would start is with that because you're in that region, but you also ha have the ability to reach out to other tribal organizations such as um, the Alaska Native Justice Center, the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, um, Alaska Legal Services. Um, even NARF uh, even might have BBB. Some, might yep might have some resources for you or other tribes. You can contact other tribes that are in the area that may have um, similar situations. Yes, I've been ask. having concerns about this because our tribe has been left behind for so many years. Hi, Angela. This is Denise. I'm with AVCP. I can have the Tribal Justice Department reach out to you after this event. I think this is a conversation that needs to be had directly with the conversation or with the department. Um, so I'm going to take your name and your number and we'll have them reach out to you. Yes, Angela Alexi, 545-3136. Okay, thank you. I'll have them reach out to you. I know some staff are online, so somebody will be reaching out to you. Okay, thank you. No problem. Great. Hello. Hi, Francine. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if a tribal court can um, uh, take a petition and um, enact a type of law um, from a petition from the community. And if it would be um, possible to write a new code based off of the petition uh, from the community. In tribal court? Yes. So the short answer okay. to that is no. So Francine, what, what, um, 
What the tribal court does not do is write laws. The tribal court enforces laws that are already written, and it's the tribal government or council that enacts and passes the laws, and then the court enforces or implements those laws. Oh, I, I, so I see it, now. Yeah, so if there's... If there is somebody in the community that wants to change a law or even create a new law, then the petition or the request needs to be filed with the tribal government. Okay. Okay. You're um, talking about someone within the community that doesn't need to like necessarily be a council member or just someone that um, is residing in the community or does it need to be a tribal member or a council member, even a council member? You know, that's a good question, but I'll tell you, I mean, you can look and see. Um, I think um, unless there's a strict rule that the tribal government has has uh, has put into place, um, normally um, anybody can bring a request. It's up to the tribal government to what they do with that request. But um, yeah, they might have a process that that they're going to follow, and um, so you'd have to check with your tribal government to see what the process is. Okay, and then uh, sorry, sorry. And then um, after the uh, petition has been requested and it's been filled out to the brim, like no space left for names to, you know, whatever, uh, the tribal court writes a law and then passes it on for voting. Like you vote for a new law to be implemented by the community or, or, um, So it's the tribal council who enacts the laws and they have their own rules how they do that. I set out and and if you if you have a copy of the PowerPoint that I just presented, um, I'm not telling tribes how to do it. I'm just saying it's always good practice to have open meetings and, and discussions with the community before the tribal council actually enacts it. But it's up to the council to enact the laws. And they just I vote on question. it. I have one question. Are you... uh, that Hello? answered my question. Okay. Hello? I have one more question. Are you trying to take our tribal government away? Is, I don't understand the question. How do you not understand one question? That is our tribal rights. How are you? What are you trying to do? So. If I'm understanding the question you're asking, am I taking away your tribal council's rights? No, I've never said that. The government is our, is the government trying to take our tribal rights away, every rights away from us? No, not not that I not that I'm aware of. No. I apologize, Deborah. I'm going to I'm I'm going to redact that last part of this and we could go ahead and move on. I think we have one more question. There's a gentleman that was trying to get um recognized and I didn't catch his name.
And that would be the last question since we've reached the end of the time. Deborah, yeah. this is Wayne Phillip. In the chat, I included a link to our Tribal Judicial Opinions webpage, and we are featuring um, our tribal judges' oh, opinions tribal. during the court hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad you mentioned at this that our unwritten laws are the highest form of tribal law. And um, on that link, you know, we have our traditional tribal judges state state their opinions during a court hearing. So mm -hmm. I thought I'd, I'd share that for everybody. That's great. And thank you so much um, for including that, Wayne. I don't think I ever, had ever seen that before. And I love that you've got it um, in uh, native language as well as English too. So that's, that's excellent. I'm, I'm glad you shared that link and I'll take a look at that. So I, okay. I think that's the end. Um, thank you, Deborah, for, for your presentation and for answering all the questions. I was really happy with everything. So um, yeah, we're definitely going to invite you back. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I did want to say um, again, thank you for, for joining mm -hmm. us and presenting, answering all the questions, taking the time and everybody taking the time to listen into this. Um, the Community Services Division is planning on hosting at least one virtual event every month. There are some months when there will be two, but there are also going to be one large in-person event every month. Right now, we have our August for the children, a tribal court focused training in person in Bethel. That'll be August 8, 9, and 10. Registration is open and on Facebook right now. So if anybody is needing travel scholarships, I recommend that you find the link or reach out to the community services outreach support to get that information. Um, again, this video, will be posted on the AVCP YouTube channel for future viewing. And um, we are done for today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I really enjoy it. And um, just for folks to know, I'll be in Bethel in, in um, August for that um, children's conference. Well, I forgot what you called it, Denise, but I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> the It's titled For the Children. Um, and what I've been following that up with is uh, a tribal court focused training because Good. that's what it is, but it's for the children. For the children, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everybody.